Good to be together as we celebrate the promises of God this morning. We're a congregation seeking Christ, sharing his love. Hope you experience that. If you're with us virtually, we are grateful you are here as well. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 62 this morning. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. You're in 
Good morning, church. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. You can have a seat. It's good to be together this morning as we celebrate being together. And um, I'm really excited to introduce someone to you that is all about connections. I'm going to ask Rachel Bender to come up here. And while she's coming up, I want to remind you about the connection card that's attached to your bulletin. Um, we'd love for you to fill that out on the back as an opportunity to share prayer concerns and praises. If you check confidential only, the pastoral team will see that prayer request Otherwise, elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will pray over those in the coming hours. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're here as well. There's a button above the live feed that says connection card. Click on that and it'll come down into your screen. We want to celebrate everyone's present with, presence with us this morning. So I'm standing next to Rachel Bender, who um, is just a huge blessing in my life. Um, and she's taken on a new role here at First Pres called the Connections Coordinator. And she's going to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about something coming up soon. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Bender. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't. My husband Drew and I and our two children, Cole and Sarah, have been worshiping here since 2017. Um, so one of the biggest blessings in that time has been that I've seen that we are a church that has something for everybody. Kids, adults, seniors, married, single, there's something. And I just love that. But if you're newer to our church, you may not know about all of the things we have to offer. So I wanted to invite you to join us on Sunday, November 3rd at 3 o'clock. We are going to have something that we affectionately call FPC 101, which sounds intimidating, but really it's just a great time to get together to get to know our pastors a little bit, get to know what we believe, um, what our church is all about, where we've come from, and where you can fit into all of that. So if you've been coming maybe for a few weeks and you just want to know how to get plugged in, or maybe you've been here for a few months and you feel like you might be ready to take that leap to church membership, this is the event for you to come to. Um, I will be out in the common at the end of the service, so I would love to talk to you more about it, and I hope that I will see you there. Um, if you are not new to the church and you've already done FPC 101, I still want to talk to you because there are so many ways to get involved and connected and just continue in this great family of faith that we have. So I hope, hope, hope to see all of you at, at the end of the service. Thanks, Rachel. We're excited about your new role on our staff. Um, I also want to invite Emily up because we have some really fun things coming um, related to worship and community groups. And as she's coming up, I want to remind you about a fantastic event coming up called Trunk or Treat. It's on Wednesday, October the 30th. Um, it's from 6 to 7, and we need people to host trunks. So if you're the creative type, come and host a trunk. Um, if you're not a creative type and want to be a part of the preparations, bring us candy. We need lots and lots of candy. There are cauldrons at the preschool and also at the welcome desk. Just drop that off and we'll make sure to give it some good use. Um, and Emily's up here to talk a little bit about something called a worship collective that she's starting a community group next Sunday. Yes. Awesome. So next Sunday, we're going to be kicking off in here right after this service. And this is called the Worship Collective. And it is a very evolving growth group or community group because there's going to be a lot of different elements in it. Yes, we're going to be learning um, the theology of worship and studying um, biblical parts of how worship was used in the Old Testament, New Testament, all that fun stuff. We're also going to be interactive. So if you're someone who really loves worship music and learning more about worship, um, we're going to be right in here. Like I said, some weeks we're going to be talking a lot, and then some weeks we're going to actually be worshiping and playing music together and talking about, hey, how do we write a song for this community? How do we, do we respond to what God is doing? Um, and we invite all musicians, but also people who, if you just really love worship music and you have a heart for worship, this is also a great place. You're not going to be put on the spot to sing or play an instrument. Um, but if you're just interested in learning about the history of worship um, and how it's evolved and how we've gotten to modern worship and contemporary worship, this is a great place for you to come. And again, if you're just someone who really loves it, this is also going to be a beautiful time for us to get together and then have a little extended worship time too. So everyone's invited. You can skip weeks. This is not something where it's going to be sequential. So please feel free to hop in if you're just curious and want to sit in one week. It's a great place to do that. Um, so I will be down front hanging out after service. If you have any questions, um, we would love to have you. 
Awesome, Emily. Thank you so much. And now, if everyone would please stand and greet one another. It's great to be together. morning. Good morning. I am Hunter and Christina and I work with our kids at the church and we love it. And if you are visiting or if this is your first time, we are glad that you're here. And we invite our kids up onto the stage every Sunday morning, right before the adult sermon. And we have a small time together with our kids. And then we go outside the door up the well today we're changing location so listen everybody look at me put your eyes on my eyes we're not going to run up the steps today when we're done with the children's sermon because we're moving to a new location because we have outgrown our old location which is very exciting so we're going to go out the door and miss chris a location is a as a fancy word for spot um so listen jim is going to be preaching on um um, the book of John today, which is in the New Testament, and we all know that the New Testament is special because that's the story um, after Jesus is born and when he grows up and does all of his miracles and his teaching and all these wonderful things. That's exactly right, Bo. You are wonderful. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, so Jim is going to be talking about a part of the New Testament where Jesus is in Jerusalem, which it was a city um, back in the day that still exists today, and um, it was a special celebration. A celebration is a fancy word for a party or something that's very fun. And the Jewish people like a birthday party, Henry, and um, the Jewish people still today have this celebration and it's going on right now and the um, word is called sukkot. Can you say sukkot? Sukkot. And that word means booths. Like, the, like a booth is like the, where you go to sit and eat pizza when you sit next to your parents at a restaurant. That's the same word. But the Jewish people have this festival of sukkot or the festival of the booze to um, remember the time that they spent the 40 years wandering the desert and that Jesus provided for them. And also it was a special time um, where they um, celebrated the harvest of all the foods that had been growing and they brought and they brought into town. So it was a very special time called Sukkot. Say that to me. Sukkot. Okay. And Jesus decided to go into Jerusalem um, to the celebration of Sukkot to see what was happening. And one of the things that they did was they waved branches and they had special citrus fruit. And it was a very festive, which is a fancy word for fun. It was a very fun time um, where they had parades and all of that thing and all kinds of fancy things. And, um, and they had a golden pitcher that was filled with water and they would parade the pitcher with the branches and everything up to the altar and pour the water all over the altar. Well, guess what Jesus did? He got up there and he said, guess what, folks? You're looking for water, but if you're looking for the real water, you should look to me because if you love me and believe in me, I will give you water that will last forever. And that water that he was talking about was the Holy Spirit. So if we believe in Jesus and we accept the invitation that Jesus gives to us to drink his special water, which is um, believing in him, um, we can share our joy with everyone, right? We're going to have so much water, it's spilling out of us that we um, can share the joy, which is filling up through us with other people. And guess what, though? Not everybody believed that he was Jesus, did they? Some people thought he was crazy. Even his brothers thought he was crazy. Some people believed in him and some didn't. 
But we are so thankful that we get to believe that Jesus is our savior so that we get to be filled up with the Holy Spirit and share that with everyone. So I'm gonna close this in prayer and Jim is gonna explain this to the adults. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We love you, Lord. And we are so glad that we get to be here today to be a church family, Lord. And remember this special time for the Jews called Suck It and how you provide for us, Lord, um, and that you give us everything that we need. And we are thankful to know that your son um, can fill us with our holy water, Lord, and that the Holy Spirit can fill us up and can not only provide everything in the world that we need, but can give us so much we can share it with others. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, kids, we're going not upstairs. Oh my. Okay, while our, <clears throat> while our kids are getting off, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to uh, the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> if you are using a pew Bible, you'll find, uh, you'll find it there and the numbering in the bulletin. If you are with us virtually or you use an electronic device, I'd encourage you to use the New International Version simply because that's what I'm using and it's good for us just to have the same, the same wording. Now, if you will look at this chapter, you will realize that it begins with <clears throat> a discussion. Uh, well, it, it begins, let me, let me just, let me begin it. Let me, let me begin it for us, kind of give us, <clears throat> give us our context. So, um, suck it now, uh, also known as the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles, as, uh, uh, as, as uh, Hunter has done such a beautiful job with our kids explaining to us. This is uh, actually going on for our, our Jewish uh, family right now, uh, these eight days, seven, eight days. And um, this is a, one of the three required festivals <clears throat> for all Jews at the time of Jesus, Jewish men in particular, to attend in Jerusalem. So it's a big deal. There's seven festivals, three that are really at that time of Jesus required. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus has uh, been in Judea. He's been in the south in Jerusalem. Um, he realizes that he, his life is under threat. And so he goes back up north uh, to Galilee, sort of home territory, <clears throat> because his time is not yet. Um, so he, he needs to stay, stay secure. While he's in Galilee, um, his brothers come to him and they say to Jesus, it's all in the seventh chapter, right? <clears throat> they say to Jesus, you should go down to Succoth. You should go down to Tabernacle. You should go down to Jerusalem. And, uh, and then it says, they, because they said this because they didn't believe in him. So they, they're, they're sending him down to some place that they obviously, well, they asked him to go. He said, I'm not going. And then his brothers go. Later, Jesus decides to go. So he journeys down in secrecy. And this is where we pick up at the end of that story in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with the 37th verse. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Or in hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Doesn't scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided <clears throat> because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. That's the word of the Lord. So, I got drawn in what started as something on social media and then has just gone, um, gone ballistic <clears throat> within all different kinds of communities within sort of my world, right? Uh, because <clears throat> on um, uh, last week, um, a, uh, 
a prominent editor of a, a progressive publication, <coughs> a pretty progressive publication. Uh, she was landing in um, San Francisco on plane, and uh, after she landed, she posted this on X, or you know, what is Twitter? Um, she says, creeping Christian nationalism alert. Alaska Air flight attendant just wished us a blessed night as we landed in San Francisco, exclamation point, to groans. Other adjectives that would have sufficed, great, awesome, fabulous, amazing, fantastic. As my roommate, as my roommate said, this ain't Montgomery, sweetie. <coughs> so, she posts this about an Alaska Air flight attendant when people are getting off the plane, simply saying, or shouldn't say simply saying, that's saying, have a blessed evening. And that is the creeping Christian nationalism alert. Now the roommate saying, this ain't Montgomery, sweetie, I'm not sure if there's racial tones to that or not. I can't quite figure that piece out. We probably won't know because she's taken the post down subsequently, <clears throat> but long enough for everybody to be on this thing. Left, right, everywhere. Everybody in support of her, um, not in support of her, all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, it, and, it's, and it's been interesting to me because I've been reading all, this, all these things, you know. It's just been kind of fascinating. People that are, are looking at it in all these different kinds of ways. And, you know, is this creeping Christian nationalism? What is Christian nationalism? What is, a, is someone saying have a blessed evening? Is that... Is that creeping Christian nationalism. Um, there's a, a religious, religious publication that I read. I actually read her publication some. Um, there's a, a, a religious publication that's saying, well, it's not creeping um, Christian nationalism, but it is a clear example of Christian privilege and, um, and how, we, how we place these things upon other people and project them upon them. And, you know, so it's just been really, really interesting. Now, the, the thing for me, though, is I really start to step back and try to reflect on it is what's most interesting to me is that the offense is saying the word blessed or asking or calling upon someone to have a blessed day or a blessed evening. <clears throat> now, that seems odd, but if we really reflect upon it, it makes absolute perfect sense because we live in a world that is formed and framed by hostility and cynicism. Don't trust anyone. Everyone that's not us is out to get us. <clears throat> and this world that is formed and framed by that hostility, and an editor whose career really is to report on, or perhaps even more than reports, this hostility daily, these words blessed, or perhaps peace, or love would be offensive. It makes perfect sense that, <clears throat> that the offense of, of Jesus, that the offense of Jesus is one when the word blessed, or perhaps the word peace, or the word love is projected. And the thing I find fascinating about this I think it's actually meaningful conversation and reflection and for us to consider all these different kinds of perspectives. <clears throat> but I find it fascinating that Jesus continually stepped into that kind of hostility. Didn't shy away from it, <clears throat> didn't avoid it. In fact, he found himself, he placed himself in all these places where all these different levels and types of hostility, creeping or not, existed. In fact, that's what got him killed. And it's important as the followers of Jesus for us to recognize that there is an offensiveness to our faith. Jesus overturned more than tables in the temple. He overturned time-endowed traditions. He overturned institutionalism and religiosity he overturned, ultimately, the powers of Rome, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace that was kept at the end of a sword. 
You see, there's an offensiveness to who Jesus is. Even those close to him. <clears throat> and I, that's why <clears throat> I think it's so interesting in this passage, not what Jesus does so much when he's there. Yes, the living waters is hugely important. <clears throat> but what got him there, his brothers, his own brothers, not believing in him and saying, you should go down there knowing that he's back up there to stay safe. And the only thing that we can infer from that is that, is that, is that they wanted humiliation, harm, maybe even death to their own brother because the one closest to them in a sense is the one that they don't understand and they don't get and so they, they need to send him out. <clears throat> and there's this, there's this sense of how that plays in. I had, I had someone meet with me a few years ago in early January because they were troubled about something I said or something I actually prayed on a Christmas Eve service. And um, in, the, in a prayer on Christmas Eve, I said that, um, I mentioned that we had been at war at that point, at war for uh, nearly 20 years. And that we needed to cry out to the Prince of Peace, and we needed to cry out for peace. And he came in, wonderful person, I appreciated him coming in and meeting with me. And he was overwhelmingly troubled by that prayer for peace, because what he heard was that I wasn't supportive of our government, or I wasn't supportive of our military. That that, that cry for peace was, was um, naive at best, that there was right and there was wrong, and we were right and they were wrong, and that wrong needed. And one of my responses, which wasn't much, was simply to say, which is absolutely true, that the, the vast majority of our congregation who asked me to pray for peace are people connected to our military. And they're the ones. I got a long email from someone that's deployed right now on a ship that's doing some really challenging things. A request for support and love and peace, and claiming his blessings in the midst of all that. But you see, this hostility is easy. It's so much easier to be cynical or to, or to view the world in some hostile way. It's so much easier to think, here's where I am, here's where you are, I'm right, you're wrong. These are my people, this is my team, that's your team. It's easier to hunker down and to, <clears throat> and to draw ourselves within and, and to find, and, and, and you know, the truth is when we really start to look at it, it's all arbitrary. But we, but we find ourselves drawn into it because it's easy. And even as the followers of Jesus, it's so tempting for us because it's so easy to get leveled down. We often think that, you know, they, we, I hear this thing a lot, like, you know, the five people you're around the most determine who you are. And I, I like that idea, right? The five people you're around really determine who you are, so be careful how you pick your friends if they lift you up or they take you down. But there's been a, a study that was done not long ago <clears throat> where they, they put people on um, an exercise desk in an office. So, you know, it's basically a treadmill under a desk. <clears throat> and they were going to do it for six months and see how it went. And so when they started at the beginning, they had all these people and they're all at all these different levels of fitness or these levels of speed or consistency or whatever. They're all kind of like that. But you know what a fascinating thing at the end of six months, almost every single person had, low, had leveled down to the slowest, worst, slowest walking person. <clears throat> and I think sometimes it's just easy. Easy to, to find it's just easy to call something out and whether it is or whatever, you know, just, to, just to, to, to label it and get it, you know. It's easy. And it's always been easy. <clears throat> There's a chapter in the Brothers Karamazov. The Brothers Karamazov is in the list of books that everyone wants to have read but hasn't, right? <clears throat> so, uh, mostly, right? I'm sure all of you all have. But it's a great book. It really is. It's long. It's Russian, right? It's long. <clears throat> but there's one chapter in it that you can just read outside of it. You can Google and find it. Um, it's, it's a story that's told that doesn't really have to connect to the rest of the novel. It's told by one cynical brother to a very religious brother. And the cynical brother tells him a story of Jesus coming back at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. 
It's a story, right? Not true, but it's a story. So Jesus comes back at the time of the Spanish Inquisition, and he starts doing some miracles in, in Seville. <clears throat> and he's doing these miracles, and he's found out to be Jesus. And so the Grand Inquisitor, the church, arrests him and sentences him to death. And Jesus is going to be executed on the next day. So the Grand Inquisitor, <clears throat> like the chief guy, you know, not only challenging whether people were, were Muslim or Christian at that time or really who were really Christians, all of that, this inquisition, <clears throat> and people were obviously executed, tortured, all of this horrible stuff, right? So the grand inquisitor calls Jesus in <clears throat> and he meets with Jesus and he goes through page after page telling Jesus where Jesus was wrong. And the bottom line in all this, he goes through example after example after example, but he basically says this. He says, <clears throat> Jesus, you came and you offered freedom. But we know nobody can really live with freedom. It just tears them up, it destroys them, it destroys their life. They can't live with freedom. They need to be told what to do. They need to be told what is right, they need to be told what is wrong, they need to be told what to do, and we, we as the institution, we as the church, we're the ones that are telling them what to do, and you've come and you've messed it up. You can't give this freedom, it's wrong. And the Grand Inquisitor ultimately says, I sided with Satan. And he knows this because of the temptations. He goes, and he goes to page after page. I mean, this, this long diatribe about, about how Jesus has just completely, completely wrong, completely wrong, the day before he's to be executed. And at the end of the chapter, he gives Jesus a chance to respond, and Jesus doesn't say a single word. But he leans over, and he kisses the Grand Inquisitor with the holy kiss. And that's it. Now, Dostoevsky is writing not about the church. He's really writing about what he saw happening in Russia with this, creep, with this socialism and this, this movement and cynicism. But the story stands on its own, right? You see, what Jesus does is he's the living proof that love disrupts. Love disrupts. And that's why the response it needs to be so bitterly brutal. It needs to be shut down. Because love brings freedom. And freedom brings and all of that needs to be destroyed by the hostile, cynical world. It's a hatred to the point of death. And yet, so essential is this distinctly Jesus love, the love of blessing and peace, self-giving love, desiring nothing in return, agape love that we say in the Greek. So essential is this distinctly Jesus love that God lets it play out. And one of the answers of why is in the text today, when it simply says, up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He lets it play out. He lets the battle between love and peace and blessing play out against the battle of cynicism and hostility and camps tribes. He lets it play out even into martyrdom. And the important thing for us to recognize is when we say martyr, we simply, it's a word that means witness. Because what God knows and what God wants is for this witness of this love to be played out against those forces. To be played out even into eternity. Jesus' glorification is simply this, his death and his resurrection. And all the rest of the story of Jesus is necessary for us in order to understand what that death and that resurrection is. That's where the rivers of flowing water come when we trust and believe in that. 
But you see, just as it was for Jesus, so it is for us. That glorification is only available at the conclusion. It's, it's only available after these forces have, have attacked and assaulted this love and this peace and this blessing. And this is to believe, to believe that the offense of God is within us, that no matter what it may say, no matter what they may say, no matter what the world may think, no matter what our human nature might lead us, we hold within us the offense of God, the offense of love and peace and blessing. We are the ones who say to people, no matter what you do, there's nothing you can do that can drive my love from you. No matter where you journey, no matter where you go, I will be waiting. Not only waiting, I will be ready to run as soon as I see you. (laughs) In that beautiful story of the father and the prodigal. You see, to believe is to know that we ourselves hold within us the offense of God, that, that this love of Jesus, this peace, This blessing will never be understood until people come to understand him and the fullness of his life and his glory and his glorification and for us as well. And so let us, let us bless, whether it be in the aisle of a plane, in the homes of our heart, the halls of our Congress, whatever it may be, let us bless, not simply with words, but with our lives. Let us live the offense of Jesus' love. And let us glorify him. And let hatred and animus and division fight back with all its force. And we will be undeterred For as the Apostle Paul tells us in the eighth chapter of Romans, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to celebrate, separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is who we are. An offense to the hostility and cynicism. An offense because we are love and peace and we desire our blessings not to be simply for us but for the world (sighs) rivers of flowing water (sighs) amen Amen. We have the great challenge and opportunity to live into this offensive love that, that Jim um, just spoke about. Oh, so good, so good. So now is an opportunity to respond. Our ushers are going to come forward to collect our morning offering. We also ask that you place your connection card in there as well. If you are watching online, you can participate as well. There's a button above the live feed that says give. Um, Just click on that and it will walk you through the giving process or anyone can use text to give. And that number is 757-530-5683. Type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, send the text and it will walk you through the giving process. And as we continue to pray and reflect on how we will um, respond to God's word throughout our week, uh, we hold so many things in our hearts and in our hands. And so we want to, um, to lift up every article in the newspaper today that the Lord's will would be done. We lift up um, our brothers and sisters in Kenya and our mission partners through Tree of Lives and we, um, 
want to celebrate the birthdays of the kids in the Joy Village. And so this month, Bernadette, Naomi, Papayo, is that, did I say that name right? Um, and Salome all have birthdays this month, so we lift them up. We pray for offensive peace in the Middle East and between Russia and Ukraine. And we also pray for refugees uh, resettling in Nigeria. In our nation, um, we are actually going to have a prayer service uh, next Tuesday, October the 29th, which is the Tuesday before um, Election Day. And we'd love for you to join us. It's going to be at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, a wonderful time for us to gather together and pray. And um, Emily and Torin will be leading the, the, um, the music. So we hope that you'll come and be a part of that time to gather, to pray, and to lift up our nation and ourselves to the Lord. We want to continue to pray for our uh, re recovery from hurricanes and disaster in Florida and Western North Carolina, and also prayers for our military and their families, especially those who are deployed right now. Um, in our city, we lift up our city leader, leaders, our mayor, vice mayor, and city council members. We also pray for continued solutions to gun violence. And as we seek to be a church for the city, we are um, always blessed to be able to be a blessing in our neighborhood. And so our Saturday soup kitchen is a blessing every single Saturday. And for the last two Saturdays, we've had around 60 guests come and be a part of that. If you want to be a part of the volunteers um, to, to help um, uh, serve those meals, let me know, and I'll connect you to Kreb Campbell, who uh, leads that. Uh, or just pray for those who come, um, that they would be blessed as they are um, here with us. And in our own church family, we want to lift up a family that uh, former members, uh, military, who are now in Florida, their names are Tiffany and Joseph Frank. Uh, one of their daughters, Carly, 11 years old, was found unresponsive in bed earlier this week. And she is in ICU, continuing to be unresponsive. So prayers for her entire family, for those who love her, those who are caring for her. Uh, it's a very tragic situation. So um, please continue prayers for Carly. They, they believe that she just had a seizure while she was sleeping. Um, and so this is very unexpected. Also, we want to continue to pray for Nancy McGee, Tom Moore, Steve Bookman, Chris McKinnon-Hing, Failing Hathaway, and Tom Celeste, Tom and Lynn Jones, and Don Bray. And we have a rose today celebrating a birth, Charlotte Louise Butts, born on Monday, October the 7th, to Rachel and Andy Butts. And Andy is deployed, so um, special prayers for the Butts family as they continue to grow. And we are also excited to share that Jim and Dupuis um, Ashburn had their baby on Thursday, McKendry James Mac Ashburn. So um, excited that babies just continue to be born around here. It's an amazing thing. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for new life, for hope, for the peace and love that, that you so beautifully and offensively, offensively offer to us in this world. Lord, we pray that we would step into it that we would step into your love and live in it and, and move in it and speak it and live it in all of our living, in all of our decisions. We pray, Lord, for those who are heavy on our hearts today, for the Frank family and so many other families that they're in the midst of, of tragic and sorrowful situations. We pray, Lord, for for our military, for safety, especially for families who are separated because of deployment. We pray, Lord, for peace in our world, a peace that only you can bring and only you can give. We lift up our lives, Lord, and pray that you would use them to exhibit your kingdom so that others would come to know your love, your hope, your joy, your offensiveness. So hear us, Lord, as we call on your name, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven.
Let's stand and continue to worship. with us for the first time we've got a gift for you it's a little book by rick warren called what on earth am i here for it's free you don't have to sign anything or shake a hand just when you go out these doors look between the doors there's a, a table up against the wall please take one invite somebody to come to worship next week someone to be able to to, to draw in to the into the true love of our savior uh, if you want to hold up something in prayer our prayer team will come up and they'll be at the front uh, anything you want to hold up uh, will be a gift for them and a privilege for you. So please take advantage of that. <clears throat> this little insert today 
um, that Valina puts together each week. This one is on compassion, focused on this passage. And there's some beautiful exercises in it, laying into that understanding that we have this offensive love, uh, a love that, that, that exceeds all bounds and boundaries. And it's just a great opportunity to be able to grow in our faith in that way. And now, sisters and brothers, live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything to the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. There is a river whose streams make life a city of